Okay, and we are live. And uh, it's been a while. It's been uh, almost like a month since the last episode, but it's been almost a year since we and our today's guest, Henry, uh, met digitally. Uh, so <laughs> this is going to be interesting because I've been following previous journey for some time. So uh, we are going to dig in today. Uh, before we start these, uh, you know, two uh, formal announcement. The first one is that if you want to find good crypto related content, go to qingnews.xyz. It's a project w which I am co-founding. And this is a place where we, you know, over 100 people just read hundreds of sources submit links and curate them so the best ones get to the top so this is one formal announcement the second one is that if you would like to plug your ad here on web free talks this is a place for your ad just let me know uh, and uh, you can write an email at mag.webfreetalks.xyz and we can have a chat so after the formalities you know today's guest is Henry Stern, co-founder and CEO of Privy. And if you ever created an account on friend.tech, you must have used Privy because they support connecting wallets, creating wallets with emails, embedded wallets, and everything else that's uh, included in their onboarding. And apart from friend.tech, you might have seen Privy in uh, T2 or Shibuya, so also pretty uh, notable projects. But, you know, Henry, let's start from the beginning since we waited so long. So what made you start working on Privy in the first place? Yeah, so uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me on. I um, I started my work, maybe it, it, it's, it's worth going back to where I started in Web3. So I started in Web3. Uh, basically, I was in grad school studying cryptography and computer security, um, was going to go and get a PhD. And a friend of mine told me, listen, why don't you come here and you can do research, but you can also uh, help launch a product. And uh, and I thought that was really enticing. His, his pitch was don't write papers for five years, come in and, and, and launch a product here, but you can still do cutting edge research. And so I joined his company, Protocol Labs, um, and ended up spending the better part of three years there where I worked a lot on consensus algorithms and uh, and then helped launch Filecoin. And when I left Protocol Labs, I think I had real uh, sort of excitement about this idea of a user-owned internet, about having uh, an internet whose core primitive is user ownership and where users have a lot more sort of consent built into the interactions that they have online because they're able to uh, really sort of signify their intent via signatures. So this, this reversal of the client server uh, architecture. Um, but I had a lot of concern, I think, for Web3 on two fronts, having spent now a few years in the space. The first was the UX of Web3 is really poor. And the second is, you know, the core attribute of blockchains, of decentralized infrastructure is it's very transparent. So you can see everything that's going on on a public system. Uh, but that makes it very bad for putting up uh, private information and user private information. And I think my sort of core take was these are linked problems, bad UX and bad privacy sort of go hand in hand in that it's really hard to build a good product if you don't know who you're building for. And it's really hard to know who you're building for if you can't touch user PII, privately identifiable information. Um, and so that's sort of what I was thinking about when I left Protocol Labs is, man, it's going to be so hard to build good consumer applications or frankly, good applications at all in Web3 unless we can go beyond building for wallets. If I can't build for Mac, if I have to build for OX123, um, there's just very severe breakdown in the sorts of things I can do to craft user experience in my app. And yet we're building this novel stack that is sort of uh, whose backbone is public infrastructure. And there's no really good place to put private user data on it. So I actually spent a year after I left Protocol Labs doing a lot of work, talking to people in healthcare, in fintech, outside of Web3 to understand how do we build better privacy tooling on the web? And that was really my goal is I want to build a privacy infrastructure company. That's that's kind of what I set out to do. And what I found is um, most Web2 startups really see privacy as a compliance problem. 
basically like I, you know, we, we know how to take on user data. We'll dump in in Postgres, but then the issues are like, I have to deal with GDPR. I have to deal with HIPAA. I have to deal with, you know, PCI compliance for credit card data. Um, and so a lot of this was software that is going to be built for general counsels, lawyers inside of companies, for CISOs, um, but it was going to be compliance tooling. It wasn't going to be engineering tooling. And so that's ultimately how I got back into Web3 and thought, you know, the best place to actually have an impact on user privacy online and on helping developers handle user data better is actually in Web3. Because you have this nascent stack, you actually have the opportunity to kind of help reshape how private data, how, you know, off-chain data, meat space data gets integrated into these new products. Um, and so that's what led me to project. Mm. It's a, you know, very, uh, I would say, long story in a sense that you started, what, like four or five years ago in Protocol Labs, I'd say, something like this. I started at the end of 2017, so like six or seven years ago yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. So you, you've been here for a while, and I really like your remark about not building for wallets, because, you know, just like we've been building QE here, it's, you know, the biggest break point is like whenever user connects to wallet and something doesn't work metamask on mobile is famously unusable most wallets on mobile basically are not that good so it i would say that you know kind of like having your own wallet is also it, it's a solution but you know building your own wallet is very hard like to make it work well and so on so that's one of the reasons I got so excited about Privy is that, you know, you make this hard part easy. So, you know, could you tell us, because, you know, right now you're pretty big, but like, could you tell us what were the early MVPs and first days of Privy? Yeah, for sure. And maybe I'll, I'll pick up really quickly with a general note and then I'll jump into it. But I think my take is, is Web3, you know, is kind of a super interesting microcosm for what the internet could be. And I think wallets as this sort of very pure form of self-custody where users really own their assets across apps is an incredibly powerful model. But I also think that, you know, the path to technological adoption is usually not, you know, what makes the most sense. It's like a bunch of emergent behavior through uh, what users are used to. And so I think this idea that, you know, somehow all of the, uh, Web two people are going to die off as they get old, and then the new generation will be Web three people who all have wallets magically. Is probably not how this tech grows. Um, I think wallets uh, and consumer wallets are a huge part of this industry and are going to continue to be. I think they're sort of the purest form of self custody. But I also think that helping regular internet users get used to self custody is really really important. So that's kind of how we got into it. But in the early days, to answer your question. Um, our sort of core insight was we need to find a way to connect on-chain data and off-chain data together in a secure way. So that was kind of the early versions of Privy. Is that, you know, I'd spent a lot of time with these, these fintech and healthcare applications. I was thinking a lot about data tokenization. So I'll take a second to explain what I mean by data tokenization. Um, you know, when you think of Stripe, you mostly think of a payments processor, right? Stripe takes your credit card data and makes sure that a merchant uh, gets money in their bank accounts in exchange. Um, but what Stripe is also doing behind the scenes, and it's a really cool sort of, you know, uh, insight that I had into their product, is they're also abstracting away all of the credit card data out of your stack. So there's this thing called PCI compliance. It's probably the most sort of well-established financial regulation that engineers know they have to abide by. And this is basically because Visa and MasterCard um, we're worried about online hacks and breaches leading to them having to replace credit cards for their, uh, you know, customers or users. And, you know, every credit card is like this big piece of plastic. It's expensive to ship to the end user and so on. And so they set up this thing called PCI compliance, which basically forces merchants to have very stringent security measures in order to store any credit card data. And for every user uh, that you have, if you don't respect PCI, you have to pay something on the order of like $5. So it's very, very expensive at scale if you're you know, building an e-commerce app to have to handle all the security. Data. And so Stripe comes in and says, you know, not only will we help process payments for you, but we'll basically take that credit card data out of your stack. We'll store it ourselves and deal with the PCI compliance. And we'll give you these sort of one-to-one -one tokens that um, correspond to credit cards. So, you know, Max credit card is, you know, 
OX123 or some version of that. It's, it's obviously not an Ethereum address, but, um, and you can store that like sort of token that corresponds one to one to max credit card. So you can charge it. You never have to touch the actual credit card data. So this is what I mean by data tokenization is take sensitive data out of my stack, replace it with some sort of token that's associated to that data. But that way I don't have to deal with it. And I think my question was, what if we took this idea, but instead of doing it for credit card data, we did it for user private data generally? What if I made it that I don't have to store, you know, your name, your home address, your social security number, your KYC information, your email address, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and instead, I could basically store a set of tokens associated to you and maybe associated to an on-chain address because I'm building in Web3 and I mostly want information to be about, you know, on-chain interactions. But I can have this object that corresponds to sort of MeetSpace Mac that I can then use to have, you know, other functionality in my app to email you. And so the first version of our product was really this data tokenization tool. It was kind of a gateway. And you could imagine that basically when users inputted private data client side, that data would go through the privy gateway. It would be encrypted. You would get back basically uh, tokens or uh, corresponding to that encrypted data. And then at any time, if you wanted to process that data, you could basically reach out back through privy and do operations on that data. But the data was always encrypted, stayed out of your stack. And the idea over time was to let the users decide who should have access to their data. Okay. And uh, how have you built this MVP? Was it just, uh, yeah, like, how did it look back then? I mean, your product. Yeah. So I've always thought that having UIs was super, super important, even for very technical products. I think I'm a very visual thinker. And so basically the early product, I started off with a UI. What would I want, you know, a developer, a console or interface to look like here? And it was basically this like web page. You could come in, you could create an app. And then from the app, you could set a schema. So you could say, I'm going to want to store uh, names, uh, credit card numbers and phone numbers. And so you would set the schema for these three sort of objects. And then you would set um, who had access to them. So you had some version of like role-based access control on your end. And you could say, you know, uh, Henry and Mac both work at this company. Mac should be able to read a name and Henry should be able to perform an operation on a phone number, like texting it. Um, so you would have, you know, on the one hand, the piece of data, on the other hand, the permissions for that piece of data. And you would set all of this and it would basically create endpoints that you could call with, you know, plain text secrets and you would get back ciphertext. But that was the, the first version of the product was this, this sort of demo. And then basically I went to builders I knew in Web3 and I kind of showed them the product and I kind of showed them how it worked. And I think the first couple of examples I used were, you know, wouldn't you like to be able to email your wallet users, but without having to deal with knowing their email address at all. And so we sort of went in and, and you know, walked people through how this app would work, try to get a sense of whether there was any interest in it. And, uh, and that was really the earliest days of Privy. So uh, were these people interested? <laughs> I mean, the honest answer is yes, uh, I thought they were. And we had, you know, a dozen customers who were super excited about this. I think a lot of the excitement came from DeFi and basically financial infrastructure that needed to build better UX, but was really, really privacy conscious. And I, my, you know, my, my thought at the time was DeFi is probably the most privacy conscious part of Web3. It is likely to be the most heavily regulated over time. Um, and it's also the one that has the most to lose. They are sort of most squarely in the crosshair of, uh, crosshairs of regulators. And so maybe that was an early lesson I should have picked up on earlier. But I think this idea for me was Web3 is going to be about developer tooling, where Web2 is about compliance. And the reality is in Web3 as well, a lot of developers were worried about compliance. How do I build better UX, but without taking on data that puts my users and my company at risk? Um, but yeah, there was a lot of early interest. We had, you know, uh, very quickly, a dozen projects sign up. And I think maybe, uh, you know, the, the long and short of it, and I'll, I'll spoil it a little bit, is we ended up working. So we we launched this product in January of 2022. And basically by June, we just saw that the adoption was too slow and that most people were using it for onboarding and for facilitating user onboarding. They were using Privy to store emails, to store phone numbers, to store social logins. And we were like, man, this product would be a whole lot better if it were actually focused on onboarding. And if instead of being a completely horizontal database, you know, you could think of Privy at the time like a privacy preserving Redis. It was an end-to-end -end encrypted key value store. What if instead we restricted 
the set of key values that you could sort of put into Privy and made it really logins. And what if we helped you uh, developers take care of auth itself, take care of wallet connections, and from there take care of getting their users' wallets? And so that's how the Privy product morphed into what it is today. Um, but at that time, there was a lot of interest. However, I think it was always an important but not urgent problem for the developers we were talking to. All of them were like, yes, we have this problem. Yes, it's really top of mind. And then you talk to them and you're like, great, when are you ready to like, you know, implement this? Uh, and they're like, yeah, probably next quarter is going to be great. Uh, and that should have been a signal early on that, that it's, it's an important problem, but it's not the thing that, develop, that, that is stopping developers from building today. I could talk more about that, but early, early lessons. Yeah, and yeah, the, this is a very, I would say, probably pretty painful uh, lesson uh, when, you know, you think that you're on it and people are excited, but apparently not excited enough. So I'm wondering, you know, what tipped the scales here? What, you know, what kind of change to your product ensure that you grew so fast because right now I I, I see you in in many many established projects. Yeah, I mean maybe two thoughts. So this is my, my the second startup I work at. The first startup I I I worked at was was coming out of college and we built this product. We had a few moments of PMF. It was a consumer product and um you know, I think the lesson I got out of it is uh you kind of know PMF when you see it. Like it, it, the, maybe the trope is it feels like your servers are melting. It feels like you have too much stuff to do and you have to start turning people away. It feels like there just aren't enough hours in the day to respond to all of the demand. And if there's any doubt whether you have PMF or not, if there's any doubt that your project is sort of an urgent need for developers, then it probably means you don't have PMF. And, and, and I think that's true. And I also think it doesn't mean, you know, you should stop working on anything if it isn't working instantly. I think it takes a lot of work to get to the place where your product is refined enough and polished enough and where the value proposition is like made clear enough that people really start engaging with it proactively. Um, but it was certainly very painful. I think in this way, I'm super lucky that, you know, I have my co-founder, Asta. Asta is a, uh, I think, extraordinary uh, sort of builder and, 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 and sort of technical talent. She worked in self-driving. And so she was, she came at this from the angle of uh, what does it look like to build data infrastructure at scale? And I think I'm very uh, uh, idealistic and maybe ideological with this space. And we both really care about data privacy, but I really care about this idea of data self-sovereignty and data custody. And so in a sense, I was very happy to keep running into walls because I, I, I the, the mission and the way in which we built was really important. And for Asta as well, but I think Asta was much more clear-eyed about um, are we are we pushing the boulder up the hill or is the boulder being dragged down the hill? And so we kept having these conversations around what's the next thing we can do to make the product better? How do we you know dial the knobs so it becomes easier to use? And I think she was a lot more clear-eyed about saying, we're, you know, really pushing this onto customers and they're not pulling it from us at all. And so I think over a number of these conversations, you know, uh, six months into this, we had a number of production users, but it still felt like adoption was very slow. And so we took a step back and we said, what is working about the product right now? How is it most useful to the users? Let's go and talk to our users to figure out what really is valuable about it without sort of pushing onto them our vision. And when we did that, we, we sort of understood that, you know, user onboarding, and the friction there was probably the most valuable part of the product. So we refocused a lot of the product in that direction. Frankly, a lot of the stack was the same, um, but we you know, cut down some interfaces so that it became really a scalpel for that use case as opposed to being a hammer. It moved from being a very general purpose database to being a very you know, single purpose onboarding tool. And then from there, we re-expanded the product surface with embedded wallets and other parts of the product. But um, you know, it took a few months. We had a team uh, that was uh, amazing and that is amazing. And that sort of was along with us for the journey. But we were, you know, a six or seven person startup uh, pivoting our product fairly, uh, fairly extensively based on the customer feedback we were getting. Yeah, I, I think, you know, getting more focused is something that very... Rarely is something that people regret, but on the other hand, it's like super hard to say, okay, we don't support it 
because it's also very emotional. Like you spend a few months, sometimes years, to build some features or to go into some direction. And some of your users are expecting you to, you know, still deliver this kind of feature. So it's uh, always, I guess, hard to cut it off. Well, and actually just, you know, we wrote internally, so we have, a, we have a handbook at the company and we have a few like product principles that inform how we build. And one of them, I think, was really born out of, out of this whole, whole process, which is in the, the product principle is every feature needs a champion. And specifically what that means is for any given feature that we think about or any given, you know, product that we want to build, there needs to be one customer who is pulling it out of us and who wants to be the pilot customer for it. And so the reality is, you know, for example, right now we're talking a lot about integrating off ramps into Privy and we have a number of customers that we've started talking to who are telling us, I really need this. We'll co-build it with you. And the way we'll do this is we'll actually embed with the customer. We will build an off ramp experience that is sort of integrated into Privy for them. We'll watch them use it. And then from there, We'll kind of pop it back into the main product to make it useful for everybody. But I think that's not how we used to build. We used to think, oh, this could be useful. Let's build it straight away. And actually, we kind of now differentiate between we have our core product surface. This is the thing that's available to everyone. And the barrier to sort of adding a feature to it should be very high because otherwise it's going to become very distracting. And I think we'll lose a lot of product cohesion. So this idea of having a customer champion for everything now is really, really important to us as an org. And I think was born of that experience where we probably spent a little too long building, uh, thinking if we keep building, they will come rather than uh, making sure that there was a user pre-ready for any given feature. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like this idea. I'm going to definitely steal it and <laughs> and use it at QE. Uh, so, you know, you're saying about this frictionless onboarding and... I remember when I saw this friend that tech login screen and I noticed there's an option to log in with email and phone. And I was like, what the hell? Like it's crypto. Like why would I give anyone my phone number, which can be used for SIM swap attack on Twitter and so on and so forth. But I of course know that you privacy is super important <laughs> for you. So I'm wondering, you know, how it works under the hood and how do you plan to educate people about the fact that, okay, it's not like in web two where you just, you know, give your phone number and someone can do something with it. Like, how do you plan to make people aware of quite new thing that you are actually deploying? Well, the new thing that you mean is, is deploying a wallet for a traditional user. So how do we make people aware that there's actually, you know, this store of, of self-custodial value behind their account? Is that, is that what you mean? Uh, uh, yeah, this and also like, how do you like educate people that you can connect your email or you can connect your phone number, but it's not, it, it's like, stored in a privacy preserving way as opposed to you know traditional uh infrastructure so there there are two things here um let me think about how i want to order my thoughts yeah so so the way we build this um maybe i'll, I'll answer the question in in, in two parts um, so, you know, we, we had this, this, this privacy preserving data store that allowed developers to associate real data to users. And I think, you know, it, we went very deep into building out this infrastructure. For example, at one point, one of our product experiments was building a email service where, you know, you would store your email associated to your wallet address. We would encrypt the email, return a token to the developer, and then the developer could actually use this service to send you an email privately which is to say they would say kind of the way Apple's, you know, private relay works. The developer would say, I want to send this email to this like token. Um, and then we would basically spin up a Lambda, um, decrypt the email in the Lambda, send the email on your behalf to the developer and then, or on the developer's behalf to you, sorry. Um, and then uh, destroy 
the plain text version of your email and come back. And so the idea was the developer can send you an email without ever knowing your email. And I think what we found, and this was probably one of our more telling, you know, frankly, product failures, um, was that this experiment was kind of like too limited for everybody. You basically had developers who were less privacy sensitive or even uh, more privacy sensitive, but who were like, great, this is awesome, but I want to, you know, edit the font size, the templating for the email. And they basically wanted us to become a privacy preserving mail chimp, which isn't what we are. Um, and then on the other side, you had like hyper privacy aware developers who were like, well, you know, this is fine, but you're using, you know, SendGrid in the background and SendGrid is, SendGrid is keeping a record of the user's email. So it's not enough privacy. And I want something like XMTP, which is, you know, just a different threat model altogether. And we kind of felt like this product iteration was not right for anybody. For a lot of developers who really were more focused on UX, the privacy preserving pieces actually detracted from their ability to craft the experience that they wanted. And on the other side, for the developers who were hyper privacy sensitive, it was still too much of a compromise. And so I think when we started building out this, this sort of uh, Privy V2, Privy such as it is today on onboarding, we decided we basically drew out a map, and this is a document that we have internally. Here is what a credibly neutral uh, off provider looks like. And I'll, I'll skip over details. I think it's a fascinating topic, but it's a longer one. But I think we sort of had this vision for, at the end of the day, what we've come to realize is that probably the pragmatic uh, uh, version of privacy is not nobody knows uh, anything about you. It's you get to choose who knows what. And I think the decision we made was we need to change our privacy model to enable us to build a, a product that developers can actually benefit from. And that really means um, uh, sort of making it that users can always exit, can always offboard, but having a trusted relationship with the user when they onboard in the first place. So very concretely, what that means today is that uh, user data that's put into Privy isn't an end-to-end -end encrypted. Privy is a trusted solution and we actually, you know, sort of see the phone number and we use all of the security best practices to protect that information. Um, we make sure that that information isn't shared with anyone, um, but you are trusting Privy to do this. And if you don't want to, you can always basically pull your data out of Privy. And we want to make sure that we return to you a rich data object that makes it that you don't lose any contextual insight. And there's a number of things that we need to do to make that better. Um, but I think that was one of the shifts as well was kind of understanding if we hold ourselves to the bar of no one knows anything, it's going to be really hard to craft good products and people will end up just not using this and just dumping data into Postgres uh, fully. So we need to be more pragmatic about the version of privacy tooling that we build. So that's the first part is, um, you know, on that education side, Privy is basically uh, a trusted party here. And we have a lot of plans on how to make it that users, for example, can run their own data storage node where instead of you know, putting in their phone number with Privy, they can run their own sort of uh, node on their machine that does this. But these are longer term plans. Um, I, I think in the short term, uh, that's how it works. So I wanted to start by clarifying and I'll pause the, 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 the maybe podcast conversation and say, sorry, that was very long winded, but I wanted to clarify uh, how it works. Um, I, I think to answer your second question, which is, you know, how do you do this user education? You know, our take was this idea of progressive onboarding, meaning you don't need to teach the user everything all at once. I shouldn't have to get a PhD level course in cryptography to start using a, uh, a Web3 product. Hopefully, as I engage with the product, the more I engage, the more willing I am to learn about how it works. And so I think our take is, you know, same goes for friction. The farther in the experience the user is, the more friction they probably are willing to put up with. And so that was the initial idea for us. You know, early on, we didn't have embedded wallets. We had this idea of progressive onboarding and this idea of progressive onboarding was let a user come in in a way that's natural to them. A lot of apps today in Web3 don't require an on-chain interaction until a bit later in the experience. You know, for example, I'm logging into this social product that has Web3 components um, and I can like posts off-chain before I maybe write a post that goes on-chain. And so the idea for us was how do we delay friction sufficiently so the user can engage with the product and get benefits from the product and can sort of build up a tolerance for putting up with friction and for wanting to engage in more complicated ways. So early on for us, that really meant let's enable users to log in with email, phone numbers, social logins, 
and let's let them connect the wallet later on when they start to need an on-chain interaction. So that was the first version of Privy was uh, let's have wallet connectors, rainbow kit that touch user data. So users can come in in the way that's most natural to them and only connect on chain when it becomes necessary. And then from there, we layered embedded wallets into it and we, we kept moving forward. But that was the idea for us on education is you don't need to do everything up front. You can delay education until the moment it becomes necessary. I don't need to tell you about wallets and blockchains the moment you arrive on my website. I really just need to do it the moment you start interacting with on-chain systems. And then I can tell you this is a transaction and it's irreversible. And then I can tell you this is what it means to on-ramp. And then I can tell you, please don't lose your keys. Um, but I don't need to do it up front. I think it's going to be scary. And you have no reason to want to use this product. You've never used it before and you don't know what it's good for. Yeah, it's kind of like, you know, in uh, Web2, when you have e-commerce, you can, you know, check things that you want to buy. Then, I don't know, new shoes, for example. You can check them. You can bookmark them. Uh, and maybe you can even make a list of uh, things you want to buy. but you get to financial you know a phase where you have to put your credit card number when you buy them like you can do a lot of things before you actually have to deal with any financial data and and i think it's kind of the same in web3 like as you said you can you know use a social app but only when there's some on-chain data involved then you have to actually set up a wallet and get onboarded and so on. I, I think the interesting thing is basically because early on this tooling was, you know, very much built for technical early adopters. We had these systems where you were say running your own wallet and you were interfacing with it with a CLI. And then maybe it's this Chrome extension that allows you to tune, you know, the gas fees associated to a given transaction. But we kind of got into a mindset where we were building for hyper technical users who cared about all the details. And again, these details are super important. I think they're an important part of controlling your assets. How much you pay gas matters to you if you're doing a ton of uh, operations on DeFi. It's the difference between making a profit and not making a profit. But for a lot of other use cases, that tool isn't quite right for the job. And so I think, you know, what, what I'm trying to, when I look at a Web3 product, think through is like, who is the end user who benefits most from this? And what is the shape of a wallet or a self-custodial interaction that is right for them. Um, and I think trying to change that mindset a little bit is really important. Maybe another thing that I guess I felt is surprising, but also kind of interesting is because we're having, you know, traditional users do so many things that are weird to them in crypto, because we're having them, you know, look at hex data or copy a wallet address, it kind of puts users in a mindset where like, they're in this strange place and they're doing unnatural things. And so they get used to doing maybe things that feel unnatural to them. And it actually is a security risk, sort of ironically, even though what we're doing is we're trying to protect the users, even though, you know, by telling them this is your public, you know, address, it belongs only to you. You're the only person who has control over it. Um, we are giving them more control. So, so even though we're trying to um, protect them in doing all of this, um, we're actually getting them to a place where they're getting used to, you know, copying and pasting hex code into things. And so it makes it a lot less, you know, scary when someone says, please now copy your private key over here. And you're like, well, I guess I should do that since I've been copy pasting things all day anyways. And so I think these questions of habits kind of cut both ways. And, um, and again, that's a lot of how we're trying to think about this is if you approach crypto knowing nothing about it, what would feel natural to you and what would feel surprising to you? Hmm. Yeah, <laughs> this is actually a very good point that, you know, just like downloading all these uh, extensions and, and, and just like, you know, setting up gas and, you know, setting up all these parameters, even in MetaMask, adding a network manually, like these are not the things that most people do. And, you know, you want to buy a shitcoin on Uniswap, sometimes you have to add contract address manually, which is also pretty, like, <laughs> not an obvious thing to do for a typical internet user. And it's kind of got me thinking that most wallets that we have are built with L1s in mind, in a sense that, for example, 
you know, on L1s, gas was very important. But on L2s, it's basically zero. Like, it's a few cents at most, typically. So, like, I don't need to have gas costs estimation and gas cost optimization built in if I interact primarily on L2s. Uh, I want to have it on L1 because on mainnet I can sometimes pay $200 in gas if it's a bad day. But like on L2s, it's kind of like a different, uh, different experience and different features of a wallet are more important uh, than, you know, than on L1s. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, that that's true of gas. I would argue it's also true of network switching. One issue that we thought was super interesting with Frentech is people sending mainnet ETH to their Frentech accounts. And Frentech is keyed on base. You can't actually switch out of base within the experience. And obviously, there's no technical reason you couldn't point an embedded wallet to another network or allow the user to do it. But in terms of user experience, it kind of breaks you out of the app experience if you have to sort of turn your head on to wait, which network am I on? How am I thinking about gas and so on? And so I think there's kind of maybe one way to think about it is like uh, what is sort of in-app experience and what is meta experience, meta transactional experience. And I think most consumer apps today, you know, when you're, you're sending an email, you're not thinking uh, what is the SMTP uh, uh, packet that is being sent right now, or what is the path that like my router is going to like take to get to the destination uh, inbox or something like that. And so I think we have to start thinking about this a little bit more is um, what are the in-app levels of thinking that a user will have? And when do we need the user to sort of pop out, take a step back and say, is this technically what I want to be doing? And again, in certain applications like DeFi, where I would argue you have a bit more of a prosumer uh, consumer, uh, a bit more of a pro-consumer, as it were, um, maybe it makes a lot more sense to be doing this type of optimization because that is part of the point. This is financial infrastructure. And through these optimizations, you end up uh, making a profit or not making a profit. But I think for a lot of social products, for a lot of consumer products, um, the product experience should have precedence over the sort of technical experience that it's built on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, speaking about wallets, uh, could you tell us a little bit more about embedded wallets? Because this is something that is a very important part of Privy. And yeah, uh, you know, could could you like explain how it works under the hood? For sure. Um, so I'll tell you a bit about how we set out to build them, if that's useful. And then I'll tell you about where we ended. But basically, you know, what we were seeing is we were building this progressive onboarding system and we were still seeing a lot of people get stuck in the phase where they had to get their first consumer wallet. And I think our take is if we take this progressive onboarding mindset, you know, farther, what could we do to let the user engage even more before they have to take the step of getting their first consumer wallet? And our take is maybe there's a way to have this embedded wallet that sits within the application that a developer has, you know, uh, some ability to customize so it fits the UX that they want, that is still completely self-custodial, but that lets the user start doing these interactions. And then, you know, to start, um, when the user needs, they'll be able to pop this wallet out and take it with them wherever they go. And so we, you know, even had a early on a question of, are, are we calling these starter wallets or are we calling these embedded wallets? And we, we have a longer term plan for embedded wallets that goes much beyond the starter wallet. But initially that was our idea is can we lower the friction of doing these transactions for users and can we let developers craft better products? And so from here, we kind of, you know, we're looking at how, you know, how do we evaluate wallets as builders in this space? And, you know, the five criteria I would say are uh, custody, who controls the wallet, who has to be trusted for it to function, security, you know, is it secure against attackers? Is it secure against the developer themselves? Is it secure against insider threats from Privy? Performance, does the system scale? Are the times to create a wallet or the times to transact really good at you know, P95 or P99 as you get a lot of load in your application? UX, um, does it look natural? Or do you, again, feel like you're kind of dealing with the meta app rather than the app itself? And then interoperability, can it be ported over apps, over ecosystems, where you're building up an identity, basically, as you go from app to app. And, you know, we looked at these and we sort of thought these are the invariants that we want. First, 
um, it has to be self-custodial. And uh, I, I've made this point before, but I think custody is like trustlessness. And these are both words that are completely abused in Web3 and that people kind of spin to mean whatever the fuck it is that they want to be saying about their own product. So I'll try to define it for us. I think for us, it means um, the end user has to initiate any interaction with the wallet. And there's a lot of very nuanced questions here for what it's worth. For example, um, I think session keys are one of the most exciting parts of AA for me, because if you're imagining you're playing a video game and you have to keep getting interrupted mid game to sign a transaction, to take an action, this game is not going to be very good. And so there's a question of, you know, can I let the developer for the duration of a gaming session sign things on my behalf up to a certain amount? And you would argue, well, maybe that breaks self custody because I'm not approving any transaction at a given time. But for us, it was the user needs to be signed in and basically has to uh, uh, be aware of interactions as they happen in the wallet. They have to be present and they have to be triggering uh, usage of keys. Um, the second sort of requirement was the user always has to have an escape hatch. There are moments where uh, helping the developer craft good UX will mean that the interfaces are too limiting for what the user wants to do. Like the example I was giving earlier of people sending mainnet ETH into their Frentech base accounts. Um, the way people got through this is they just exported their keys. And so when we launched Embedded Wallets, we had a key export. It's not perfect. In fact, it makes me very uncomfortable to ask end users to manage private keys for the reason I was telling you before. It's just not good behavior to, 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 to try and promote. But for now, it is the least worst option we have for making sure that a user stays in control. And I think having an escape hatch, always being able to reclaim your wallet and pull it out of an app is a, is a sort of precondition for me to self-custody. And then I think um, from a developer standpoint, from a sanity standpoint, our thought was the system has to be really simple because it needs to be auditable and it needs to be easy to secure. And I think simplicity is a way to ensure that you understand how the system works and you can sort of run through it. It has to rely on tested cryptographic primitives. For instance, here, I'm really excited about uh, threshold signature based MPC. I think it is probably the most promising technology that is coming for our space. I also think today it's a little bit novel. This is 2020s sort of technology. It's great um, at doing a number of things and it has a certain number of advantages over other primitives that you could be using. But um, there are no great cryptographic libraries out there today that are built, that are open source, that are well reviewed. And so it really means that you're building on this, this less tested uh, thing. And I think our take was we wanna make sure that the primitives we roll are thoroughly tested, have been battle tested for, for years and that we're basically not dependent on um, uh, novel technology. We want to make sure that what we build is future proof, hence the simplicity, so we can upgrade the stack over time. But we also want to make sure that there's a certain level of maturity to any sort of core architecture that we use. Um, and that was the last one is let's make sure that basically we can upgrade the system over time, because one of the most exciting things about crypto to me is just the pace at which we're pushing the technology forward. So that was very long winded, but those were the requirements we set out with. And what we ended up on is basically deciding to use a Shamir secret sharing based system. And it was a bit of a process of elimination. You know, the simple straw man would be, uh, I store keys for users. And obviously that is not possible. Like that is not self custodial. That is not privacy preserving. Any breach of privy uh, is highly problematic. So maybe one level up is, you know, what if I do end to end encryption on the keys? And we already had this entire system built out from, you know, our key value store that we had. Um, and frankly, we had people using that first version of Privy to store private keys. So it was not a crazy idea that, you know, we could do this. And I think our fear was simple encryption is not good enough. Simple encryption means that if your database gets hacked, um, then the attacker has ciphertext of the keys. And so it's just a question of time and money before they are, they're able to brute force that ciphertext and get the user's keys back. So we knew we wanted to basically have key splitting or some version at least where even in the case of a breach on privy side, the attacker did not have full control over keys as soon as they threw enough compute on the attack. Um, and so that left us with, you know, really three technologies, TSS, Shamir secret sharing and secure enclaves. Um, and basically we went for Shamir secret sharing because we felt it is the most sort of well-tested primitive out there. It's highly flexible and it basically allows us to do the fence in depth by layering various technologies into the system. And it's very, very performant at scale. Um, the way it works, and I'm finally getting to answer your question is this. Um, so you come into a product with Privy, you will you know, say, put in your email address. Privy will send you a six digit code of challenge. 
to which you respond um, and that will sort of authenticate you. So we know this is Mac because Mac has been able to provide the response to the challenge. Um, and from here, we'll issue an auth token to you. Um, and Privia actually works with third-party auth providers. So it doesn't need to be our auth provider, but we have one built in to make it really easy for you. So we'll, we'll keep going with that example. At that point, you have an auth token and you can basically use it to create an embedded wallet. So what happens is we spin up an iframe in your browser. It's running on a separate subdomain and basically we generate a private key in that iframe. The iframe is not accessible to either Privy or to the developer. It's only accessible basically to the end user with their auth token. From here, the private key is generated, a wallet is derived from it, and the private key is immediately split into three shards. One is used on device, meaning it's stored in your browser memory or in your phone secure enclave. Um, one is used uh, by Privy as sort of an auth, you know, gated to the auth mechanism. So next time you sign in with your email, we say, oh, this is Mac again. He has access to the second chart. And I'll leave the third one out for now, but whenever you do an operation, basically using your, your wallet, what's happening is you're making a request to this isolated iframe. And you were basically saying, you know, I want to sign this, this string. And the iframe is basically going to say, is this Mac? Does he have the auth token? Yes. Then I'm going to pull the device shard from memory. I'm gonna pull the off shard from Privy using this off token. I'm gonna to combine them to reconstitute the key. I'm gonna perform the action and then I'm gonna destroy the key again. So the key itself never lives stored anywhere. It only ever exists in memory. And what Privy is storing is that off shard and then the user is storing the device shard. Now, obviously there's a question of wallet recovery and this is the third piece. Um, what if the user loses their device? What if you use or lose your phone number? How do you recover? your wallet. Um, and so we have a third shard called the recovery shard. Um, there are three options for it. Basically, it can be stored by Privy, encrypted with a password that is derived from your auth token, or that is only basically derived and only accessible to the holder of your auth token. It is stored by Privy, um, encrypted with a password that the user sets, um, that is the default. And then it is, um, uh, we're building out a mode where the user can store their own recovery shard in iCloud, in Dropbox, in Google Drive. Uh, but the point is, if you lose your device and you connect to a new device, then basically the same operation is run. You make a request to the Privy servers. Privy says, oh, this is a new device we've never seen before. Here's the off shard. But then we're basically going to go out to our recovery service so you can get the device shard. And then the, the encrypted device shard is sent to the client, decrypted in the iframe, and then reconstituted with the off shard to make a whole new version of the key that is then split again and you now have a newly provisioned device. But the point is uh, Privy basically only ever holds the off shard and then depending on the configuration holds an encrypted version of the recovery shard on completely isolated uh, uh, servers. And so if there's ever a breach of one part of Privy, we're able um, to hopefully basically rotate any of the recovery shards to make sure that the uh, breached uh, off shards, for example, are, are not usable by the attacker. Did that make sense? And yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'm wondering, you know, what would happen if Privy went down or went out of business? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, well, let's, let's, do, let's do them in that order. So if Privy went down and Privy is sort of running the recovery service for you as a user, then basically you would not be able to reconstitute your keys for the duration of the downtime. And you would basically have to wait for Privy to come back up in order to make a call, get the, the off shard and then come back. Um, this is part of why we have key export. We want to make sure that you're able to, if you already know enough and you're willing to put up with the friction of say, now installing a MetaMask, and storing your embedded wallet yourself, you always have access to it, even in the case where Privy goes down. And then maybe what matters most is we do a lot of work to make sure we don't go down. You know, over the last month and a half, uh, uh, it's been a lot of fun to see Frentech scale. It's obviously put a ton of pressure on our servers, and we haven't had any downtime. So we are, I think, uh, at this point, four nines available over the last three months. The last, uh, I think, we had about 40, uh, 20 minutes of outage back in, in, in early June. In fact, I remember it was June 13th because AWS had an outage across the Northeast 
Uh, and, and obviously that took us down for a few minutes. Um, but we do a lot of work there. If Privy were to go down though, um, you, you, you would not have access to your keys for the duration of that downtime. Um, this is where the third mode of recovery matters, the one where you store your own key shards. And this is why we think it's important. Um, if you're storing your own recovery shard and Privy goes down, then basically you would be able to reconstitute your own keys using your device and your recovery shard. So you'd be able to connect to say your Dropbox on your device and basically run an operation to recover your keys in that case. Um, obviously the point for me is you're trading off basically friction and maybe UX for an upgrade in the underlying sort of security or custody model. Like we spoke a lot about product, but I'm wondering, you know, how do you actually acquire users? Because you are basically a B2B company. Uh, so I'm wondering, you know, how you got clients like friend tech and, you know, all the other names. Yeah. Um, you know, I, th I think the reality is there's no, there's no silver bullet. I think we spent a lot of time, uh, building the product. we spent a lot of time dog fooding it. So we spent a lot of time building apps ourselves that use privy to make sure we felt good about it. We felt good about the guarantees it made. We felt good about the interfaces it exposed to develop her experience it provided. And basically, as we were getting more and more confident that we'd built something that we would want to use, um, we were also talking to developers and trying to get their feedback. So it's a lot of outreach. It's a lot of looking at you know projects we love in the space that we use and saying, man, this product could actually be a lot better if we worked with them and reaching out to people and saying, hey, this is what we're building. This is what a demo might look like. Um, here's what you, 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 we should talk and we should see if there's something we can build together. There was a lot of us going to conferences and trying to meet developers there, um, giving talks about Privy, trying to get the word out. And so early on, basically, it was a lot of outbound uh, and us reaching out to folks. And, you know, from uh, having a nice demo that they could try out to uh, even building, you know, sample integrations for them so they could see it. And we didn't have to, like, have them imagine what it would be like to use Privy. We could actually show them this is what it would look like if you use Privy. Um, and then basically over time, as our product is, 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 is present in more stacks, um, we have more people coming to us. And so now we have a lot of inbound of folks who are, you know, wanting to use Privy. Privy is still not self-serve. And that's sort of an interesting choice that we've made, which is that the product is, is, is obviously uh, completely ready for prime time and could turn on self-serve at any given moment. But I think it's felt really important to us to be able to work very closely with the products that use us to understand what it is they're trying to build to help them craft better UX and, you know, maybe more importantly, to make Privy a better tool. And I think that comes from really understanding how it's being used. And so for now, at least, we have decided to basically spend a lot of time with all the developers that use Privy to talk to any of them before we give out API keys. Um, and that's really meant being able to build closely with those partners. Um, and I think, frankly, that's been a big part of, of how we have met a lot of our customers is, you know, we have folks that we work really closely with who then have a friend who's using, you know, some product and wants to uh, try Privy out and, uh, and then they come and talk to us and so on and so forth. Okay. I really like the way that, you know, that you promoted it with this reaching out to products that you like and, you know, proposing tool to make them better. Uh, and I also love your demo. Like I obviously played around with it and it's very, like it gives you this magic moment super fast uh, because you can set up your own onboarding. It's like super customizable when it comes to how it looks and so on. So it's like very, very cool tool if you want to just get the feeling what Privy can deliver. And, you know, I'm also wondering like what kind of metrics whether they are qualitative or quantitative, do you follow when building things like Privy, apart from users, I guess? Yeah, it's, it's something that, frankly, I think we have to improve at a lot. We have a very good sense of our metrics. We have a few dashboards that we look at to understand how is the product being used. And, and I would argue, uh, yeah, and it needs to become an, a more present, I think, part of how we build generally. But the way we've thought about it is really sort of there are four types of metrics. There's quality metrics. How good is our product? Is it doing the things that we say it's doing? There's scaling metrics. Can our product grow? Is its usage growing? 
and there's engagement metrics. Does our product impact our customers sort of, you know, user engagement in the right ways? And then maybe the, the fourth one is, is kind of like a market metric. Um, are we moving the market along in ways that we're hoping to see? Um, and so, you know, within quality, it can be uh, how long does it take to onboard a developer onto Privy from a moment we give API keys to the moment we have a live integration? How long did that take? How many questions came along the way? Um, likewise, how long does it take to onboard a user uh, from the moment they open a Privy modal for the first time to the moment they're logged in and they have an account? Um, in terms of scale, you know, how many customers do we have? How many users are using Privy at the end of the day? Um, and then looking at how many of these, for example, have over X transactions per day happening through embedded wallets. Uh, on the engagements, it's, you know, number of sessions per week, uh, percent of, percentage of accounts that are using, you know, Privy has both embedded wallets and external wallet connectors. Um, what portion of customers are using just one, just the other, or both? Um, and then I think a couple of the metrics that I found really, really great with embedded wallets is also how good are embedded wallets at bringing people onto Web3. So there are two metrics here that I really love. One is what percentage of users who have an embedded wallet then uh, basically get uh, an external wallet. And I think that's been really interesting as sort of the embedded wallet as an, as an on-ramp into Web3 and to mm -hmm. self-custody. And then the second one is what percentage of users who initially connect an external wallet choose to get an embedded wallet? And this is the other thing is we've seen a lot of very native crypto users who are like, man, like my external wallet is great, but also sometimes it's so much easier to just use an embedded wallet. I would want to use both. Um, and so I think those are all the metrics that we track. Very concretely, I would say the mistake not to make is to try and sort of have a metrics buffet. I think you kind of need to drill down to what are the North Stars? Um, what are the like you know core metrics that are going to drive the way you're making product decisions? And for us, it's really number of customers in prod, time for a user to get through onboarding, and then number of users who have uh, an embedded wallet and choose to get an external wallet. Those are the three metrics that we track most closely. So could you share more or less what kind of percentage it is of people who get from embedded wallets to creating external ones? Um, let me, I'm, I'm preparing a larger sort of uh, blog post with okay. sort of the state of Web3 markets such as we see it. The reason I'm a little bit reluctant is obviously just because this is uh, I, I, I want to think through more carefully what is sensitive data and what is not sensitive data. So I'll plead the fifth for now, but I'm, uh, I'm excited okay. to share that. Okay. Okay. So just, you know, DM me when you get your yeah, uh, blog sure. post ready. Uh, okay. And, you know, let's say it's 2030 and Privy has, you know, fulfilled its mission, it's growing fast, everyone in the world uses Privy, whatever. How does the world look? I think there are probably three parts to it. And I think, to be fair, it isn't just Privy. Like, as an industry, I think it's going to take uh, an industry-wide effort to get this working. I see this as Web3's mission, and this is why I'm excited about Web3. And I think it's going to take a lot of collaboration from, you know, uh, uh, people building onboarding systems and user management systems, people building wallets, whether they be consumer or embedded wallets, like it's going to take all of us collaborating to make this happen. And I don't think this is just a result of Privy being successful. I do hope we can help shape this market by building good products. But, uh, but this is what I see as sort of uh, maybe our worldview uh, coming to be in, in 2030. So the, the three parts I think that are going to be true is first, um, we're not talking about Web3 anymore. There's still a very vibrant ecosystem of hyper-native apps, of apps that are you know, very deep in the weeds of how end users can utilize decentralized infrastructure. But I think for the most part, you know, no one's that shocked about it because decentralized infrastructure is, all, is everywhere. And so I think there's a great proportion of traditional uh, apps that are hybrid apps that use both centralized and decentralized infrastructure cleanly together and make proper use of, I guess, the trust benefits and the transparency benefits that decentralized infra gives us. And then where needed, fall back on centralized infra to perform operations that don't have these requirements. 
Uh, and so I guess, you know, that's the first thing is in, in 2030, uh, the majority of apps online are basically built on this hybrid stack that uses both Web3 and Web2 infrastructure, such as we think of it today. But in that sense, um, we talk about Web3 a little bit less as this sort of uh, separate part of the tech stack. Um, the second thing I would say is you have this really wide usage of consumer wallets. Um, and basically you have this really clean pipeline of people who get to know their first wallet through an app. And then there's this interplay of people who pop embedded wallets into consumer wallets and then pop consumer wallets back into embedded references. And there's this sort of, uh, and I think this is an extremely challenging and interesting set of UX questions, by the way, which is how do you get user consent as you move through these different uh, contexts? But there's basically this clean environment in which these wallet ecosystems basically are part of everything we do as consumers online. And really what that means is we have real ownership over our data, our assets as we get on the web. And I think that version of ownership is a lot more fluid than it is today where basically it's, you know, bring your own wallet or bust. And I think that's what we're trying to do with embedded wallets is to make this something that's accessible to everybody. Um, but basically everybody may be as part of what ships with their iPhone or with their Android device has a native wallet that is sort of their custody fallback and they keep moving in and out of these custodial, uh, self-custodial experiences, that's what I mean, but experiences where they have real custody um, on the web. So that would be the second part of, I think, that worldview that exists. Um, and then I think the third part is, um, as a user, I have this interface that I can query to understand how my data and how my assets are being used. I can ask very simple questions like how much gas that I spent over the last month? Um, who has access to my email address online? Um, I don't want Mac to see my phone number anymore. He's been fucking spamming me for a month and a half. Um, and these sort of real world controls, I think are essential to how I hope the internet is gonna shape out. Um, frankly, I think most users will not engage with that interface. Most users um, will probably not care. Um, but I think for the portion of users who do, having that interface is gonna be essential and it's gonna shape how builders are sort of shaping their narratives around it. And maybe the example I have here, so maybe one of my favorite parts of, of, of frankly, I would call them consent interfaces online over the last 20 years is the way the iOS ecosystem um, gets user consent for sharing access to location, to contacts, to notifications. Um, and what you see is, uh, you know, it, I was an iOS developer once, um, when you are requiring notifications access as a developer from a user on iOS, um, you get to ask once. If the user says no, you don't get to ask again. And so developers are super, super careful with how they ask for consent because they know that if they get turned down, they know that if they ask too early and the user doesn't understand why would I give, you know, Duolingo notifications access, then they never get to ask again. And so typically two things happen. One, you delay asking for notifications until it's time. And you know, after I've taken my first Duolingo course, maybe now I understand why I'd wanna get a reminder tomorrow. Um, and two, and obviously this should sound familiar with progressive onboarding and the way we're thinking about these things at Privy. And two, um, usually developers are sneaky and instead of straight up asking for the system based, give me access to notifications, um, they pop up a screen first that says, would you like to give Duolingo you know, access to your notifications? And that's actually a Duolingo screen. So if you say no, Duolingo can ask again later because they never actually queried the OS to do it. But I kind of see blockchains in their purest form as kind of a consumer level OS for the internet. And so I think my hope is there is a uh, sort of healthy tension between the control developers have to balance sort of their UX and the control users have to say no to things and to say, give me my stuff back and to say, I don't want to interact with you anymore. Um, so that's what I hope the internet becomes sort of, you know, 15, 20 years from now. Well, that's a very uh, optimistic vision and I it aligns very much with what I want to happen. So uh, thanks for uh, sharing that. So Henry, like we are getting to the end. So I got one super important question, which is 
where can people learn more about Privy? Where should they go? Um, Twitter is always a good place. Uh, we are Privy underscore IO. Um, a lot of us on the team are on Farcaster and very happy users. So we're always there to chat as well. And then um, we actually have a blog that we try to write on. You know, sometimes it's, it's important product updates and sometimes it's just random thoughts about the market. Uh, but we have a product blog that we, uh, we really like to, uh, to, to, to push content on. So blog.privy.io is probably the, the place to go as well. Okay. So if you want to learn more about Privy, go where Henry told, told us to go and also play around with the demo. It's really, really cool and works like magic. So yeah, I, thanks Henry. I'm really glad that we finally made it. It took a year, but it was worth uh, waiting a little bit. And I really hope that you will, uh, you know, grow more and more. And uh, we are also going to discuss the idea of using Privy at QE. Uh, yeah, I I'm not sure if this is the moment where we are ready for that because we have like very OG users at this point, like everyone has wallet, ENS name and so on. But maybe um, once we want to add some new features, it will make sense because having embedded wallets had give a lot of, uh, you know, UX freedom. Oh, you got out for a second. Ah, uh, ah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it cut me off. But I, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, that, uh, yeah, that we are, we are, we might be not ready yet because we have very OG users, but once we decide to add some new features, maybe it will make sense because these embedded wallets, they have some very, very good uh you know they unlock many new options for uh for apps so that's I think interesting one of my takes here for what it's worth you know the, the the way i would present privy to anyone is to say we're building one library for all your users whether they're an og with 15 wallets across six providers or they're web3 noob who doesn't know what a wallet is we want to make sure that you can sort of serve them the best way and so one of the very early features we built was the ability to link multiple wallets to an account. Because what I kept running into, you know, I have four or five wallets with which I trade NFTs. And I basically kept having to connect and disconnect each of my wallets to OpenSea to trade. And it was very frustrating because I kind of just want to see my whole portfolio. I kind of want to just be able to keep, obviously, the custody of each of these wallets separate because there's a reason why I have four or five of them. One of them is a hot wallet, mm -hmm. I have two cold wallets. Um, but I also want to get a user view that is more global. And so, you know, what, what I would say my, my, my pitch would be, I think this is where our wallet connectors are very useful. Um, you can start off by having Privy be a tool for your OG users. Um, and then over time, if you want to understand, hey, would my users be interested in getting email notifications, for example, when something happens in the app? Or would they be interested in having an easier way to sign for certain operations, but not others? Um, that's where you can start doing more product experimentation. But I would argue that, you know, one of the things that we're most excited about, and we just did actually the ETH Global Hackathon this weekend, which was really amazing to watch, is kind of seeing people experiment with what does Web3 UX look like. And one of the reasons why we build these wallet connectors is because we don't want to just be a tool for, you know, Web3 noobs. There's something very special about having sort of public decentralized infra and I think it creates new experiences and we want to make sure that we are sort of in the middle of where these new experiences meet sort of uh, uh, really delightful UX. So I'm excited in any case we're here for it whenever you're ready. Okay okay so thanks a lot Henry it was a pleasure and you know see you online I guess. Thanks Mac.